Good morning, everyone. Lovely, lovely to see us on this morning when we've had a little bit of rain. That'll keep me happy for a week and it'll keep the men happy for two days. <laughs> but no, it's good. It just feels, it feels very good. One or two notices. Have we got any visitors? I don't think we have this morning. Thank you, Joan, for coming. It's always a pleasure to see you. And a warm welcome to those joining us on live, live stream. Now, Helen Carr, one of our church members, and her family for years, I mean, literally, I think it must be 12 or 15 years, have organized a sponsored walk to raise money for lupus, something that Helen's had for a long, long time. Now, Joyce, bless her, over there, will be taking part in the walk next Sunday and has left a sponsor form in the back if anyone would like to sponsor her. Knowing Joyce, she could probably do the walk there and back twice by the time some people are finished. But so if anyone, I mean, I think in the past, well, I've raised several thousands of pounds. So, um, but thank you, Joyce, for doing this. It's really good. Um, and a lot of the money is spent locally as well. So that, that's really good. Now, what's on this? We, or more importantly, we raised, Fliss is smiling. It's lovely to see that smile in the front, Fliss. £427 was raised at, um, for Christian Aid for the emergency appeal from the closing collection at Fliss's commissioning service. Thanks to everyone for their generosity. So I think that's, a, you've made a good total this year, Joyce. I don't know what you're up to, but you work, all of you, you will all work very hard behind the scenes there. Now, this week we have got Zoom Bible study on Monday, 7.30. Thursday, 10.30, Ecumenical Bible study in the Warm Hub. And on Friday, the church summer coffee mornings are going really, really well. They're just... It, they're just going very, very nicely and uh, very ecumenical as well, which is good. So, you know, we haven't made a big deal of them this year, but it's certainly serving the purpose, which is about getting people out and about and having a chat with no pressure. Saturday, I don't know if there is a coffee morning in the Glendale Hall. Christine, do we know? Secretary can't remember, honestly. I'm glad there's someone like me. <laughs> Patrick's email says there is a one, so there possibly might be. Right. Well, read the notices on the high street. That's the main thing. But also on, on Wednesday, you'll have seen these signs. This is just a free, sort of a free lunch. Well, it's not the free bit's not the important bit. The Glendale Connect are providing a sandwich and refreshments for everyone that wants to meet on a Friday lunchtime. I, not ideally, but initially the hope was that people with young children would think it was a really good idea to go up to the Glendale Hall and just not have to spend that money on children's lunches because it is the summer holidays and things are, you know. But if we are full of church members, that's equally as good. But, you know, we'll give it another couple of weeks and if it doesn't take off, um, we'll probably stop it. But it's certainly happening, uh, happening this Wednesday, 12 to 1.30, okay? Uh, now, next Sunday, we've got a treat. We've got Anne Tonard and Fliss Barker. They're going to be leading our communion service. But unfortunately, this will not be live streamed. <laughs> this will not be live streamed because of the summer holidays. But thank you very much for doing this. And we've got coffee after the service, so do stay if you can. And Joan, thank you so much for coming. Well, it's nice to be back again, though I was only here a week or two ago. Uh, but it's nice to be back again. 
And of course, we also remember all those who aren't very well at the moment. Um, as you will, uh, you will notice, Alan isn't playing the organ this morning because he has COVID. Um, and, um, but thank you to the music group because they are going to be providing our music for us. Um, thank you also to our wonderful tech team um, at the back who's going to keep us all straight. As we come to worship, we focus our hearts, we focus our thoughts, not just on this place, but upon God. Because it is awesome to gather before God. We're here to celebrate with wide-eyed wonder, for the God of all worlds is with us. Many signs and wonders are being done among us. So let us give what we can to all who have needs so that all people, no matter who they are, may shout for joy as a part of God's commonwealth in this place. So let us worship our creator. We're going to start by singing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling in a jazzy way. Let us pray. Great giver of all rich, blossoming life, we call upon your holy name. Loving mystery, we have come to be with each other in your presence. We have come because you have called us. Lead us now, O oh God, through the maze of our existence as you led your people long ago. 
Keep us from resisting your word of judgment or shrinking from the challenges of discipleship. Call us by name and show us the pathways you would have us travel. Fill us with your love, O God of mystery. For we gather in the name of our Savior, who is the Christ, the door to eternal life. Holy One, we confess to you and to one another that we have not always followed Christ's example. When we have been abused, we have been abusive in return. We have gone astray. Lead us back into your fold and guard our souls in Jesus' name. promise of our faith is that if we entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly, we need not feel threatened, for we will be returned to righteousness. Having been brought back into the safety of God's fold, let us be at peace. Amen. I believe, is it Joyce that has our first reading? Okay. The first reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 25. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his, foot, in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen.
The second reading is John chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen. Amen. And we get a chance to sing, I don't know, that, that song, I thought that song was brilliant. Um, Jesus the Lord says, I have a breath. Please stand as you are able. Lord says, I am the bread, the bread of life. 
if you are a teacher or a parent, you know how hard it is sometimes to get children to listen or to engage with you. And sometimes adults aren't all that much easier. Even when we're trying to help, our way of teaching or leading sometimes just doesn't work. And we have to stop and try and think differently. I really salute all of those, especially teachers and parents out there who can think creatively as to how to catch someone's attention, how to get them involved. In Jesus in John 10 is trying to explain himself, who he is and how he leads people. He doesn't talk about city folks jostling in the market square, but about sheep going into the sheepfold. Now the word for sheepfold in the original language of the New Testament basically means a courtyard, and thus any outside enclosure. Jesus says he doesn't wrestle or force people to God, but leads them there like a shepherd. And we know it's Jesus if he speaks to us. He says he calls us by name, which is very important in biblical times because one's name usually said something essential about you, who you really were. Jesus means that he knows our name in the best way. Not to shout at us or threaten us, but to help us realize that he really knows us. He knows the true us that others don't know. Like those things that shake us with fear. He knows our secret hopes that bubble within us, our painful regrets that nag our conscience, our deepest wounds that invisibly bleed, and our unfulfilled aspirations that still nudge us to be better than we are. He knows all such things about us and loves us anyway. Jesus, who knows us best, loves us most, we discern when Jesus speaks to us because he wants what's best for us. Now, even though later believers, and I know, of course, all of you, understand completely what Jesus meant in his own time, what he says doesn't always make sense to the people that he's talking to. So Jesus uses comparisons to explain how he cares for us and leads us. He uses these word pictures about himself in order to engage the minds of people in his time. So living in a rural area, Jesus often talks about agriculture. But the shepherd and the sheep thing didn't seem to go down so well. So, thinking creatively, Jesus tries another comparison. I am the gate for the sheep. Or, as older translations had it, I am the door. The word door also means gate, doorway, or gateway. Artists that throughout history have had a field day painting Jesus as the shepherd. I know probably all of you can think of a picture of Jesus that you've seen, usually the smiling face, the sheep over his shoulders, or carrying the sheep, or something like that. But how do you paint Jesus as a door? Easy enough to paint the gentle shepherd carrying the fragile lamb, a lot harder to show a gaping doorway or a swinging hunk of wood as a somehow personal welcome to God. The Santa Maria Church 
sits on a hill in the city of Estepona, Spain. And two faces stare out from the arch over its beautifully carved main door. One face, a male, with his tongue sticking out at you. And the other face, a female, looking hopping mad. <laughs> Maybe such artistry made some sense over a church door back when the place was built, but not exactly inviting today. When Jesus calls himself a door, he's not warning us or shooing us away from God. Jesus naming himself the door is good news. Any fans of John Le Carre? Author, writes novels, and they're the sorts of novels you're never quite sure what's true and what isn't. In one that he wrote called The Little Drummer Girl, a daughter relates, supposedly, a description of her father after he's recently returned from prison and won't open doors. She said he couldn't open them. He'd go up to them and stop and then stand at attention with his feet together, his arms by his side and his head down and wait for the warder to come and unlock the door. The first time it happened, she said, I couldn't believe it. I screamed at him, just open the door. And his hand literally refused to reach out and do it. For many people, there seems to be a barrier as solid as a door between them and God and they won't face it, let alone move toward it. God and anything you say to portray God seems unwelcoming to them. That door just seems so forbidding. Many years ago, many, many years ago, I heard an old Sunday school sort of rhyming song and I'm hoping that none of you have heard it, because there's a reason. And this, it said, one door and only one, and yet its sides are two. I'm on the inside, on which are you? I could hear little kids singing that song, and then see them stick their tongues out like that carving above the door in Estefona. And I could see that carrying over into adulthood. The church, now an exclusive place, those on the outside, somehow, just not good enough. Jesus calling himself the door isn't to frighten or belittle us, but to attract us. Jesus is a completely open door not one that only swings open with an arrogant, patronizing glee, including some and excluding others. And no one else controls that door. If you read the text again, it actually, at least in a version that I looked at, said, Jesus says, whosoever comes, not those I have chosen come. Whosoever. In the Middle Ages, when trade guilds passed on the knowledge of craftsmen, carpenters adopted the motto, I am the door. And when they made doors, they deliberately created the doors, two small upper panels and two larger lower panels, and what was created from that was a raised cross. Most people have a door somewhere in their house with this pattern on it. It's actually called a Christian door. Think of Jesus' cross as a door that invites us to enter as a way to be reminded of our Christian faith, we can remember and we can see it. 
see the cross every time we open a door. Jesus wants us to see him as an open door because he isn't a, rod, a roadblock to God, but an entryway. He's an open door to God's open heart. He not only shows us the way, but is the way to God and the way to live for God. He's not an exit door out of life, but into true life, the kind we were created to live. Even Jesus' expression about the allowing the sheep to come and go is an expression that means that they move about freely. The courtyard Jesus leads us into isn't a prison, it's a temple. He brings us abundant life and true freedom, coming and going in choice, not cramped, not rigid, not halfway, not someday in the future life. Sometimes the faith that the Bible tells us about is a faith to just hang on and endure. It's what I call the getting by faith. Sometimes that's exactly what we need. But Jesus tells us here in John about a different aspect of faith. He's not offering us a faith so that we can escape from life. He's also not offering or granting a faith that always keeps us safe from the bad things in the world. He promises, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus changes the quality of our lives not just the duration. The life he infuses within us helps us to live in this world as he does. That's eternal, abundant life. And that's what's most important in this passage. Jesus' life here is abundant. Maybe our Sunday school teacher or some evangelist or some fire and brimstone preacher that used to be around years ago taught us to concentrate on getting into heaven. But I don't recall anywhere in the Bible where Jesus traipsed around Galilee telling people, if you work really hard and if you pray really hard, that maybe someday, just maybe, you'll get into heaven. Maybe you'll be on the inside of the sheepfold. No, he told them to live within God's realm now. The God who is here right now in Jesus' invitation to life, who summons us through Jesus to live in a heavenly manner on earth. Jesus gives us that life now. More life than we expect or anticipate now. More than enough now. And that's better news than just some time after death being led into heaven. Jesus' voice drifts through the door of the cross, speaking our name. We don't have to fear him or fear when he comes and knocks at our door and summons us. He'll calm us with faith and strengthen us with hope. He'll lead us in love to true life here in the vast courtyard of God's creation. He will be forever our door, our gate. Eternal abundant life starts here. Trusting God and serving God joyfully as did Jesus, whose entire life is pictured for us upon the open door of the cross. And that's an image that we can remember. Amen.
we're going to sing again, Will You Come and Follow Me? And if you're able, please stand. our offering will now be received. Loving God, we bring you the gifts of our labor and the gifts of our love. May all these gifts help us to do your work in this place. This we ask in Christ. Amen. mindful of all sorts of things going on in our world and in our community. Let us come together and open our hearts in prayer. O spirit of creation, new life is everywhere around us. This is a time of energy and hope. We give thanks for your presence with us and for the consciousness to know and to appreciate all that you have done. We thank you for the signs of life around us in creation, in the church, and in ourselves. Today we stop to wonder how it was for those who knew Jesus as their teacher, who felt his vital presence. May we walk forward through the door that has always been held open for all to enter through. And there may we find a peace and a joy that are beyond our imagining. God of new life. No matter how hard we work and no matter how much we worry, the world does not seem like a perfect place. The pain and suffering are still there. We carry it with us, bringing our pain and fear into this place today. There are homeless people on the streets. There are families afraid of the bills that the next post will bring, wondering how they will cope. 
where they can cut back. There are young people who abandon hope in the future. There are older people who are alone, lonely, feeling unseen and unwanted. Every day, people die from violence, disease, neglect, and starvation. And there are those inner torments of anger, loneliness, and grief as well. At times, our hearts are full of grateful thanks for all the wonder of this life. And then we learn that someone else we love is stricken, or the violence has flared again, or flood and famine are rampaging, battering what little hope is left for those caught in the path. We've learned that times like these are very difficult to face alone. And so we've come together like sheep who need a shepherd and together turn to you to ask for comfort, help, and healing. Hear now our prayers for those in pain and need. Hear also those prayers of joy and celebration that we must not forget to bring. Hear now those prayers for ourselves. For we have come to know that we won't make it on our own. In the quiet of these moments, hear our prayers. God, we know that your love is our reality, but it is so easy to lose our focus. Like those on the road to Emmaus, we fail to see you until you come to us as a stranger. We so often miss the shepherd because our focus has been elsewhere. Hear us as we set our hearts and minds on Jesus, the door, once again. And pray the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. But our final hymn this morning is Source and Sovereign. You know the two.
one of the commission trees. I think they deserve a real clap today because they've done an outstanding, outstanding job, just not only with music, but reading and notices and doing everything else as well. have been claimed by God, our good shepherd. Take your part in the ministry of Jesus Christ, the door, and listen for the wisdom and understanding of the Holy Spirit, granting you life so abundant that you will experience new energy for every task in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>